He's a giant among giants, a true American hero, and our group's now namesake. He's a visionary who founded our beloved Vanguard and is considered the father of indexing. His life's work has been to ensure that investors get that we investors get our fair share. As we said in the dedication to our Bogleheads Guide to investing, while some mutual fund founders chose to make billions, he chose to make a difference. Please welcome our friend and mentor, Mr. Jack Vogel. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
But uh, so things are good for the development. What never knows when you're dealing with the kind of maladies I have and what's going to happen next. But I don't worry about that. And I will never have to worry about it. And I never expect to worry about it. Uh, I should say, in the last couple of years, I've been feeling more comfortable than ever uh, at Vanguard. Uh, I mean, that's some management issues. <laughs> Investors who invest for the 
has been a great privilege and to see it all happen in an annual really fast. If I couldn't be gone, it would be happening anyway, of course, but uh, it's, it's nice to see, I guess you could say, uh, the ideals and kind of come true. And if you want to put that next slide on, Kev, um, this is just a story of the Anglos that wrote in that low point when we were pulling ourselves together in 1982. And when our assets began at 1.4 billion on that chart, and we were up to 5.6 billion in 1982, and 400 billion, there was just 6.7% there in 1998 or so, and now 1.4 trillion, a thousand times uh, what our initial assets were 1.4 billion on. Uh, as one might say, uh, just a few more zeros to deal with. And this is an important point about that, which I'll talk about. And the industry rivalry uh, with Fidelity is the next chart. And uh, you can see that chart sends a lot of message, doesn't it? You can't miss it. You might as well go on to the next one, but we won't protect. <laughs> this is uh, their share of market trade since 1998. And ours has been rising. These are the long term assets. Long-term assets because the money market becomes kind of buyout things. Uh, <coughs> capital growth is a major factor in the business. It doesn't really have any money market fund. And Merrill Lynch was led by their money market fund for a long time. They're not the leadership group anymore. And uh, and Fidelity is it's a huge money market business. And the reality is, and we've seen this, uh, we've seen it in the press. The Vanguard is now 75 billion dollar debt Fidelity. And uh, the reality is that the number is 285 billion ahead. Um, Fidelity is a billion 175 or a billion 390. Um, a trillion 390, excuse me, a trillion 175. And we'll talk about zeros. So uh, by that measure, we're at 250 billion dollars ahead of Fidelity. If you look at long term assets chart here, Vanguard is at a trillion 225, and Fidelity. $725 billion, a $500 billion difference from this one industry leader. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better. In the last three years, Vanguard's taken $350 billion of shareholder purchases, and Fidelity has lost $15 billion in shareholder purchases. So I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a second. But there is one respect in which Fidelity is still the champion. Last year, earning, the earnings of Vanguard's management company were zero, and <laughs> Fidelity's earnings were $2.6 billion. $2.6 billion. So we're not competing too well in that way. You know, I'm tired of Uh, 1990, the is still in there. At one point, 
1998, actually Merrill was the largest firm in this industry. And now, of course, it's mutual fund activities at Vaughan, part of BlackRock. Uh, and uh, that is Vanguard in 1998. And it gets into the top group. And we start moving up in 2000. And then second, client fidelity. Finally, in 2010, current date. And with industry assets up to 7.9 trillion long term assets, here we are at 15.7%. Uh, and it's, uh, we've been driven uh, to that point, I think, first by investor trust. Uh, surveys have done this. I don't need to read the surveys, so I just read the letters I get from shareholders. I read the newspapers. But trust, just you know what I mean, it's industry by measurement from independent sources. That uh, has the same kind of rating. I think our rating is like a plus. It's kind of a funny scale. And we're a plus 50 or 60. And the second firm is maybe plus 30. And uh, mutual fund act, fidelity minus two or three, I think, for trust. And uh, the industry average is about minus 12%. Industry with minus 12% trust ratio. I won't get into that, but uh, that's not good. And we're at the top of that list. I imagine what we'll be. Other reasons to include not in the order. Uh, there's been some interest in bonds. You know, it's amazing. We have I've always been interested in bonds. Uh, and uh, to the point where in 1972, when I was at Wellington, I wanted to start a bond fund. I got these notes from my partners. You must be nuts. Bonds are yesterday, stocks are tomorrow. Uh, don't start a bond fund for that convince me now at the time. <laughs> Institutional investor actually had a cover entitled Bonds or Debt. And uh, then I knew it was time. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't get it done. The board directors didn't support me, the board directors didn't manage it, I needed to support me. So I conned them into creating a fund that was two thirds in bonds and a third in income producing stocks. And that would be the wealthy income fund. So the fund we acquired and the little Philadelphia fund built up from there. So bonds go back a long way. Um, service, no question, very good. I'm going to write with the shareholders. They're telling me what good service we have and we have ratings. That kind of thing about what personal observation we have to be more. Next, I guess I'd say importantly, we deliver what we promise, which is not much. It will give you our fair share for whatever returns on stock market generally must provide. It's not a grand claim, but it's the only realistic claim in this business. And uh, so that's been an important part of it. Another part of that, I don't know if any of you this, but uh, one of the things we had going for us, uh, and, and I realized this at the beginning, that there's no point in building a firm that's so big it can't manage the assets it has. And I knew we would get big because we had a map on our side, and it's not complicated. Four minus two is two. And we're okay. Well, in our case, it's 4 minus 0.1, 0.2, 0.2. Uh, and, uh, but if you get big, you can't manage the assets. And that's what happened, I think, in the capital group. Uh, and they're not bad. They're nice people. Very nice people. But they just got too big to manage. There's a huge amount of money under their supervision, which includes a very large council operation as well as a mutual fund operation. So being sized and different kind of investment strategy investing, where uh, doesn't really matter how big you are, you can still implement your strategy. The same kind of uh, influence or impetus at a trillion dollars as you could at a uh, hundred million dollars or a million dollars. You can get better, better than a million dollars. So that's another big asset. And of course, the next one is cost. And I put that last uh, because I don't think most people will realize how incredibly important that cost is in this equation that we have.
20 years, 5, it'll be 100, who knows, I don't know. But I do know, quote Shakespeare, I can't remember what play, money she lost his head, where's the crown? Uh, you know, here you are, party full, and there's certainly no room to go in that, we just to say, and no room for complacency. When you think of, you know, dropping from a 15% market share to less than 1%, and why don't read cut a very small portion of the industry now, 0.7, they certainly got their fair share sure of publicity like they say causing that flash crash. You got the idea that one firm could cause that flash crash. I think it's absurd. But um, they gave it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so why if the market is that fragile one probably worth nothing? And even T Row Price, a well managed firm, producing good performance, at least in recent years, and a lot of market shares in the eighties, uh time we can move that the time we can do this. Um Franklin, even though the merger with uh, with Templeton, as well as X market share, and uh, well, like twenty percent so far. Um, so there is no room for complacency. Uh, I want to just come back to cost and sack and talk about the cost and in this world in our uh, in our total uh, performance picture. And we put out you've probably seen it in our our uh, in the Vanguard. Or we uh, have a little calculation that says uh, how our funds do uh, after expenses, that's the way we show it. And I've been doing this, by the way, this chart uh, since way back in the 80s. I remember when this came on, people were all of printing managers, and then I showed up the numbers of cost, uh, and uh, they, they turned out not to look like so brilliant. And uh, we actually lost one manager, a guy named Jerry Jakes, to Putnam. For a while, he was a good bond manager. And he had a great record, but he was working on a bond fund with a 15 basis point expense ratio. And when I went to Putnam, he had a 1.15% expense ratio. And they said, What happened to all your management ability? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't last very long. Uh, but he couldn't have done the math. It's all math. And, and so I've been doing this for a long time, this is not giving me a vanguard at all. So what we see, what you see, and what we report is our stock funds are in 60 first percentile, uh, bond funds 100, balance funds 89, money market 100, and overall 82 percent. Very good records uh, in terms of outperforming our peers over the previous decade. Uh, then you take expenses out. Look at how those numbers change. The stock funds are not 61, they're 42, uh, from somewhat above average to somewhat below average. Uh, and the comparison is not totally fair, it's probably about as fair as you can get in the computer groups. No one's trying to know what to make it easy, but they don't any easier than it is, or what to make it any harder. And the balance funds drop 10 points, the money markets, but the money funds go up from 100 percent now to 57. And you're telling me the cost is not an advantage. Uh, the money market funds go up from 100 to 40, uh, and the overall goes from 82 to 51, way above average to average. Is that bad to be 40 in the money market area uh, and only 57 in the bond area? The answer is no. And that is, I don't mind being below average before you adjust for expenses. Because at least my, my approach to all this when I was running the company was don't take any extra risk. To the contrary, be safe. And the munis hold 15% cash reserves. That costs your return. So we had still had before expenses. Above that average return, I would have been worried because there's no free lunch out there. And so uh, that's the way it looks, and that just shows you the whole cost and all this performance. And we, we forget a lot. And uh, so I'll go to the number to try number eight to just talk about our growth and efficiency. And one of the remarkable numbers that we don't see much of is uh, there's our assets growing over there from 3 million to a trillion four. Our expenses. 470 fold growth. Our expenses, and we get a lot of credit for reducing expense ratios, but I have to uh, scratch my head a little bit. And I want to see our expenses grow up 400 fold compared to a 470 fold increase in, uh, in, uh, in assets. And so the expense ratio comes down by a little over half, probably 60%. And uh, I think it's not so difficult. 
when you have all the economy of scale, maybe it's commensurate to demand. I think we have a problem, and I would surprise our ending in our problem. And that's a basic point again, right? It's $140 million. So you say, this is a nice idea, you can spend $140 million, and nobody will ever know the difference. Uh, you know, for our expense ratio, 23, 24, would anybody know the difference? How do they know that? We don't, I mean, it's not even a real number. We don't have to take all the loans and force them out. And we manufacture that number. Manufactured in a good sense, we do it right, but it's not a number that appears in the funds report or anything like that. So uh, it's uh, in our advertising program, it costs about fifty million dollars. It's easy to just about a third of the basic point. I'd say I caution that. I'd say stop. And I caution the industry stop thinking in basis points and thinking dollars. And the dollars are dollars. Dollars are money. And uh, the fact that we're large. A basis point or a third of a basis point, uh, fifty million dollars, is uh, not something you say. Well, let's spend the money until we can afford it. Not a good idea. Um, so that chart really explains. You know, people ask me periodically, how is it possible you can have the best service and still have the lowest cost? Can you have uh, the best service despite the lowest cost, or can you have the lowest cost and still have the best service? It's easy. Um, you know, if you need to spend money on services, it's basically the services are good because we are the lowest cost. It's cost not that, it's not that. And if you're, if, you're, if you're that efficient and low cost, and someone says we need $10 million to get that statement to the uh, uh, you say, I mean, you can analyze it, even I would analyze it, but basically you say charge it. Um, so uh, I think. Uh, it's still about 55 employees per, per billion to 80 employees per billion. It's a nice testimony to the economy of scale, to the role of technology, the communication, the telephone, device is much smaller now in this day and age compared to internet communication. And I think we've had very good management of that security too. Um, I would not have much of a manager, by the way. I don't care much for management. And uh, I don't know how to do it. I know I'm a manager, and I'm pretty sure I'm not a leader. And I'm confident I'm not an entrepreneur. I really don't like business very much. <laughs> <laughs> and all those things are true. Um, I don't want to say, this is being recorded with something. <laughs> um, and, uh, but just coming back to the fact that these principles that we had at the beginning amazingly remain intact. Use a little bloody common sense in uh, developing index funds, and developing defined maturity bond funds, in having a mutual structure and getting the cost out, and getting rid of sales loads, and then in deciding if there's a rule that nobody has ever done before in this industry. We were the first ones to do it in 1992, and that is differential pricing. Give your largest shareholders the lowest cost. And you'll see, if you want to look at next one again, um, you'll see this at the end of the ad we had the Admiral Treasury funds, they had to have at least $50,000 in the fund, and they paid an eight basis point expense ratio or something like that. Very low at the beginning. Uh, that was still the case in, in 2000, and we found ways to have Admiral classes in nearly all the other funds. And that's a low cost for investors over $100,000 they were getting that whole class and the management kept that name, the original animal. And uh, so by 2005, that was 26% of our assets in the animal class, our investor class, $240 million. And now, with the recent change, which you read about, and I think largely a lot, I did read your commentary on that in the, on the local website, uh, taking into account the amount that's going to go over to getting more of these two million accounts that will be eligible. It's going to be something like 30% of our assets. And this not only gives us great economies of scale, but the $100,000 account is much cheaper to run. It's close to the same amount to run as a $10,000 account, obviously. Um, so it adds to our economies of scale, and also build up large investors coming into the funds. And as we have large investors, and the total expense ratio. So it's really a good, simple, I'd say moronically simple idea that anybody could have thought of. And they uh, nobody did. And I can understand that. Uh, and I had just read a little bit of it. Um, the, uh, I talked about this, and it's the same philosophy I think it's today. If I can find this, I talked about this in 
meeting, right? We would have, have, had a management meeting uh, in which uh, I decided that um, uh, we had too many sacred cats and our things, people that were never, uh, never going to do. And uh, one of them was uh, not responding enough. People thought we would not respond to uh, the possibility for our competitors to lower prices selectively in the future. Because I was dumb enough to think one of our competitors would say, well, Vanguard has a, probably at that time, 30 basis points match ratio, and let's have a class of funds to 25 or 20. That would have been a logical thing for the later to give our prices to do. What did they do? Nothing. So, as I said to them, we'll introduce uh, lower cost funds known as admiral funds for our larger investors. We must teach them, our competitors, less than real price competition. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, let's see if I can find it here. The genesis of the admiral concept is speaking to the crew, and this is on page 176 of character counts. Um, this is the concept, the obvious insight, just that everything I did was obvious, is the cost of handling shareholder account fixed, larger investors generate substantial economies of scale. The sooner we can deliver these economies of scale, the deliver, deliver to our investors the better. For the only a matter of time, I thought, until our competitors would have to offer lower price funds to the largest investors, a market segmentation strategy under which they could at least pay lift service to the bankers' cost advantage. I continued the Admiral Treasury Fund, 50,000 investments in minuscule investment ratios, designed to attract and retain substantial investors. They were our way of firing a shot across the enemy's bow, letting our rivals know they better get ready for even tougher price competition. And that's just exactly what happened. And I think we just fired yet another shot across the uh, competitor's bow, the enemy's bow, and these new ideas of of the Admiral uh, taking it down to the level of lower uh, expenses. Uh, now, it's a great thing to do. It's a wonderful decision by management. I was not involved in any way in the decision, nor should I have been. And so it came out of the whole thing, the losing thing. But I just want to make sure everybody understands that this is not a gift to the large investors. I mean, think about this for a minute. It's just a reallocation of cost. That's all. Because of Fund A of the Vanguard structure has lower expenses, then Fund B will have higher expenses because our expense number is more or less a fixed number. It just gets divided on the funds for a year, um, depending on the relative assets, and there's some flexibility on you know, how we allocate these benefits from one fund to another. So it's, uh, it's not a gift, uh, but it's a smart reallocation of the cost of the cost. Only makes longer in the future. Uh, let's go to number two. Uh, I don't have any other one. The, uh, All right, we don't need to have an interaction. Do we have an index one? You want to go back a couple? One more. Uh, one more. One more. No, no, not that four. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the index one, that's, that's where I want to start. And then we're going to index and share, and then the composition, okay? Um, I told you it work long and hard, and didn't have quite enough time to do this. Um, talking about indexing, I, in, in 1995, I think. 1994, I wrote a book called The Triumph of Indexing. And uh, it's uh, now, that might have been a bit of a stretch. And actually, I wrote one even earlier than that. But everybody said it was too early, but I, I, I could see what was happening. And it sounded like a nice phrase. And <laughs> we, uh, certainly, we now have the Triumph of Indexing. In the past three years, uh, indexing has taken in. Funds have taken in 340 billion, and actively managed funds have lost 260 billion in cash flow. So the industry 80 billion, the better number coming in common stock funds and equity funds. So that plus 80 is plus 340 for investing and minus 260 uh, for active management. And I even that's 
going to change. It can't stay that way. And, but over time, it's got to be the direction of the trend that we're, that we're in. As people are waking up, institutions are waking up. And the federal employee strip plan uh, is an index fund, uh, and corporations are moving for indexing in their 401k plan. It's just an idea whose time has come as they walk through. Uh, it's about time. Uh, you can see the share of equity fund assets done by investing. Uh, and uh, from zero in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 1.6% in 1990 to 23.7% now. That has been a trend, I don't know what it is. Uh, and yet the one thing, pretty obvious, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit, is in using the title of my speeches. Uh, it's a great paradox. Just as active management is getting more and more like indexing, so indexing is getting more and more like active management. And I don't like that. Uh, I don't believe it's going to work in the long run. And we'll just have to see. Uh, the, uh, you can see that the, the ETF share, the market share, has gone from zero, of course, in 1990, to 2.5%, 17%, 36%, 52%. Uh, apparently, the same returns as your competitors. 
but you're winning over to my boss over time. So multi-manager funds will be in that category, and money market funds are in that category, and the municipal bond funds are all in that virtual index category. So we're really heavily dependent on indexing, or if you don't want to phrase indexing, on broadly diversified, low cost, uh, low turnover, uh, state of course, the kind of funds, and uh, we're 82 percent by the measure in this chart. I think it's even higher than that. Uh, just to give you a few examples, if you put that next chart here, um, just look at the correlations going down here. Uh, the index funds are 98 or 99 or 100. Uh, the virtual index funds are 98 or 99 or 100, uh, and the actively managed funds are also remarkably high. We like middle of the road managers. That's just why the manager company runs well. But they're uh, the only manager. And uh, you can see the correlations are remarkably high even for prime tax, strategic equity, and the costs are low, and the turnover by and large is well below competitive strategic equity. But that's all our runs at us. Anybody can spend it. But uh, when you throw these virtual index funds, you can see the correlations there. And you can see the cost, and you can see the turnover, the long term treasure. I'm not sure why the turnover is so high, uh, but uh, I have some good with cash flow. But in any event, we are really an index firm, or a middle of the road firm, or a broadly diversified, low cost, low turnover firm, uh, whether you use the word index or not. Um, so, obviously, the future for indexing, I think obviously, is, uh, is bright, very, very bright. But uh, as I talked about, you know, and to me, index funds have another great business and social purpose. And they are, uh, in this era of rampant speculation, uh, the only long term investors left in America today. You, know, you read about one of these trading firms holds its position for an average of 11 seconds. <laughs> 11 seconds. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but to me, that is not long term investing. <laughs>
allow corporations to give their shareholders money for political contributions. I was just outraged. But I thought, uh, even though I thought that maybe disclosure of, of those political contributions would be kind of a rain on their giving, uh, I wrote an op-ed for Business Week uh, suggesting that uh, investment managers put resolutions in the corporate proxy of every corporation they own, saying resolve the corporations that make no political contributions without the approval of 75% of their shareholders. And uh, that went absolutely nowhere. Nobody made any attention to it, no one answered it, no one looked at it. They haven't heard the last of it, the last of it. you better believe that. <laughs> and, and, and then it got even worse with these recent Supreme Court rulings on allowing these 501c3 charitable institutions, nonprofits, uh, to, to use half of their, uh, make half their contributions for political purposes. You can't make more than half. So these foundations are created to be political in nature and anonymous in nature. So that break that disclosure might have created is now gone. And so these corporations will be able to give away all the darn money they want for whatever purposes they have to do it. And that's, that's an outrage to our democracy. It's an outrage to, I think, our way of life. And uh, so I haven't given up. And I think the next chapter in that yet to be written. And we will see whether we can make some progress on that. A big part, as I mentioned, of the, of the index business is ETS. And uh, just to be very clear, I have no problem with ETS. I think they're good if they're broad market indexes, if they are health if they provide a significant expense ratio advantage. And uh, that doesn't seem to be the way the industry is being driven. Um, here are the market leaders in ETFs. This chart's actually a little confusing. Uh, but uh, the first thing that jumps out is these are the three big indexes now, the ETF managers, the Vanguard, uh, and uh, yeah, coming in late to be third. Uh, but uh, growing very rapidly. Uh, and uh, you, you can see uh, the, the indexing business is confined to a you know, fairly small amount of companies, uh, and most of whom are doing more or less the right thing, they think the right thing, in creating ETF products. I mean, I don't know why anybody would buy an ETF for Brazil or Germany or something. It may be a good bet, it may not be a bet. I just don't believe in betting. And, uh, Vanguard has the marketing uh, thing, uh, and uh, again, there's no harm if you do it right. But I'm afraid I'll talk about this in a minute. There's a lot of harm if you do it wrong, and most people seem to be doing it wrong. Uh, conspicuous by their absence in this group are our other big competitors: uh, Capital Group, American Funds, Fidelity, who does a lot of selling of ETFs and its brokerage operation, and T. Rowe Price, which is going to manage. Uh, he says they're going to manage actively manage. What the point of an actively managed ETF is, is, is it beyond my comprehension. I and mean, I can see speculating hour by hour on what the market's going to do, I guess, uh, or what Brazil is going to do. Uh, but uh, I can't see why you would speculate that way with an active manager. Because what happens hour by hour doesn't change anything for an active manager. But in any event, whatever will happen, will happen. It's not going to be a significant uh, factor. Or despite our low ranking there, uh, we are basically shooting the lights at Vanguard, for better or worse, uh, in terms of cash flow. Uh, this year, so far, uh, Vanguard has gone to, uh, BlackRock has about 39% of the cash flow, State Street has 25%, and Vanguard has almost 50%. How can that be? They add up to 113%. Well, the answer is that remaining group, largely speculative funds, as a minus 13% cash flow. So you want to say that the numbers can trick you sometimes. Yeah, but, um, and that, that's good. But, but some of the things out there, these reverse things, uh, I think just, uh, they're, they're great marketing ideas. They're great ways to prey on the innocent investors. But are they good ways to invest those long term? I just don't think that's even a market way to honestly. Uh, look at the turnover, astonishing. Getting that on him. I'm the one that thinks 30% turnover is high. And uh, you can just see for all these indexes, Brazil is kind of hot, emerging markets are very hot, uh, and the turnover just is 
staggering proportions. Gold, of course, half. These are the, these are the high, highest turnover, the ten largest ones. And uh, the, just, uh, it, it's very clear that they're used for speculating and not used for investing. And you know, brokers like to use or for investment bankers or somebody, spiders that kind of, you know, they, they gamble on it during the day or they all set a short position, that kind of thing. Uh, so we're going to enter into the reality of ETF investing for the typical investor. But it's still an enormous turnover thing. It raises the question, uh, do ETFs provide value to investors? And the answer is, let me go to the next chart, uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, I selected the extreme examples. Uh, but, uh, Here's how the ETF did in Hong Kong, 9.8% a year. The average investor in that ETF earned a half percent a year, a lag of 9.5%. Uh, global index, the ETF made 1%, the average investor lost 10. Uh, emerging markets, Vanguard emerging markets, the ETF did 12.2%, the average investor in our ETF did 2.8%, uh, 9.4% of the points are, you know, or 25% of the points are earned. And look, more, look down more broadly because no one is more capable of uh, finding an example of Bruce's point for the whole global. Um, look at the whole market, and uh, you can see it's very consistent. Uh, the gap of um, three or five or eight or nine uh, percentage points in annual performance over five years is a huge gap. Uh, and uh, it, it just shows that working for the marketers, but not so well for the investors. I should say that Kevin gave me a list of, I think, around 275 ETFs, these numbers on them, and five of them, five of them, shareholder returns were above the returns of the ETF itself, the same as or above at least 270 that had this lag in the shareholder returns. 270 out of 275, and the five are probably funds that just aren't going anywhere. No one's buying them. Selling them, so it's very hard to mess everything up. So I, I have a concern about ETS. Um, now we have 16. This whole I'll just mention briefly uh, the new book. Uh, it's called Don't Count On. And we have it. Who'll be there? Do we have a cover? Yep. We didn't want to betray my Princeton heritage. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you can, well, we'll have copies for you this afternoon, but I don't want you to be reading it during my speech this morning. It may not be that good, actually. Um, but uh, it's a tome. I want to go back to the previous one. Uh, the theme is basically on the perils of numeracy. Um, but the, uh, the subtitles, and I'm going to give you another subtitle on the cover of the subtitle so you get a good feeling of what's in it, of these seven parts. Are, uh, what do we call it? Oh, investment illusions is part one. Uh, part two is the failure of capitalism. Part three is what's wrong with quote mutual quote funds. The distinction I continue to make with the word mutual. Uh, part four is what's right with indexing. There's a surprise. Uh, <laughs> part five is entrepreneurship and innovation. Part six is idealism and the next generation. And part seven is heroes and mentors. And it comes in at 587 pages. Good luck getting it home. <laughs> if it wasn't so expensive to mail, I would have had Vanguard pay for it. <laughs> can't do that. And it's really an anthology, most mostly an anthology of the stuff I've written over the years and just different subjects. Has an absolutely wonderful uh, forward by Alan Blinder, a professor at Princeton who's at me. Focused on basically uh, the belief that numbers are real. Uh, the numbers tell us more than other values. We think we can count a lot of things. Uh, the things we can count are more important than the things we don't count. Values and all that kind of thing. The way the numbers we get are absolutely crazy. Uh, we accept them at face value without looking beneath the surface to see where those numbers come from. Uh, 
we're not allowed in here and we can do it or not. And, and, uh, and then uh, basically they are uh, capitalism and mutual fund industry. In this new system that we have, agency system, which I mentioned, where these uh, corporations are on 70% uh, by agents of other uh, of shareholders, um, bottom line shareholders, 70% compared to 80% that agency society was on unchecked. Uh, the forum by Alan White, Professor Princeton, was wonderful. Um, he wants me to be a new czar. Maybe a little late for that. And I got a great blurb from Paul Oker, Arthur Levin, Henry Kaufman, uh, Stephen Tallett, the author of The Black uh, Swan, and Jeremy Grant, one of them were outstanding. And Ortega, to say at least. The song was very happy with us. He's going to be a good seller. And you'll see a fair amount of repetition in it. Uh, because I didn't know how to do it, I want to make it a kind of book where you can read a chapter without reading everything that came before it when it follows. So there's, you know, probably more repetition than I would like to have. I could have written it into a single book. But honestly, I just didn't have the energy or time uh, to do that. Uh, so just flip through it, enjoy it as you can, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. Some of the stuff's kind of fun. And uh, so then uh, that's enough for the book. Markets, the last session of these remarks this morning. And, and I mentioned uh, the problem is that the money manager is a big thing, a lot of the financial problem we have now. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, they've grown to dominate in our business, and, and they are speculators. They're by and large speculators for other people's money. And uh, that is not a happy event. Um, for our financial system and for our society for that matter. And uh, what we've lost is a focus on, we're going to focus on stock prices, momentary stock prices, and left the focus on intrinsic corporate value, which is going to have a really long term. And you know, I'm heartened by the fact that some people like the Greens and Bada agree with me on these points, and Charlie Munger agree with me as a partner, Charlie Munger, and Paul Munger and the other people. Uh, we got a system that's a mess. Uh, so, forecasting the future is a, a very difficult thing. And I think, I don't know where we put that on that sheet. Let's start by talking. Well, I can't work on that. Now, let's start by talking uh, about the future for stocks and bonds in these incredibly speculative markets. Uh, I want to be very clear that, that uh, I'm not sure how much. Speculative market should matter anyway in this room. When you get that crazy crash, uh, flash crash, so called, in May, what did it matter to us? Uh, you know, everything got back to normal. It mattered to a lot of people. I don't know if you had all the sale or anything like that. And you do see your broker and Pete has some protection against that. But uh, then things come back to normal. And in the long run, in the long run, 100% that we get stocks and bonds is created by corporate America, or corporate America and bonds, and uh, that, is the, that is the return that's available in stocks. The special development of that, for the people that may hire low PEs, has massive effects over years, sometimes over decades, well, over decades. But in the long run, it has a lifetime, unless you're very, very unlucky, uh, everything irons out. Behavior usually about the same thing as the work So, uh, and, and, uh, all this noise, I said in one of my books, I think it was a pretty good phrase, but of course I always love my own phrases. Uh, but the stock market, it turns out, is a giant distraction for the business of investment. And all it does is subtract value from the intrinsic value created by corporate America. Sometimes stocks get way above that, and therefore, price gets way ahead of intrinsic value, that's good for sellers and bad for buyers. When price gets way behind intrinsic value, it's good for buyers and bad for sellers. Because the stock market is this closed system. There's no advantage. And net, net, net. Except there's a disadvantage in terms of cost. The stock market subtracts value from that value created by corporate America. You know, because we have cost of national remediation. Let's just take a, fun, a funny little look using these ideas. Had uh, 
first you start it, the equity risk premium. Uh, and then there are, and uh, in these areas that we've all gone through, where investors' mindset goes from optimism to pessimism and back and forth. And there are various lengths, there's no predicting the length, generally a decade or more. And uh, the dividend yield change, that means the dividend yield didn't change by 5%, but went from 5% to 7%. And you can see those yields back in World War I, in, in, in even, even in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and the yields were pretty good. We had 7% yields before that period, 6% in the 70s, and uh, you know, 1974 was a very time when it was very easy to like stocks a lot because the yields were 6% in 1974. That might have been pretty close to 7 And so uh, the equity risk premium uh, in the subsequent period, very good if yields are high and see that pretty consistently. The role of yield, I'll talk about this a little later, is greatly, greatly underestimated by those people who are predicting the market. Um, so let's see if we can think a little bit about what the equity risk premium might be today. I'm just going to look here and see if the one back one's going up and quite see that last number. I'm working on this one piece of Yes. Uh, and uh, that's so stocks like bonds by 6%. So what do we think about the coming decade? Uh, and you can look at the last 100 years, look particularly at that dividend yield, and you can see the, the speculative return, the change in the price earnings ratio, uh, percentage change in the price earnings ratio annualized, contributed almost nothing for the last 100 years, uh, and we have a return of 9.6%. Uh, and for the last 25 years, the uh, speculative return, PE went to 10 to 20 to 40. Uh, and then back to about 18 where we might be today. Uh, so still contributed to the market of the investment during the last 25 years. But you can see that the corporate earnings growth is 5 6%, very similar. The dividend yield contributed a little less in the second period, 3.5% and 4.5%. So you need that as context for what we're facing in the future, because that's what's going to dominate your returns. The blue does not dominate, the blue goes away eventually. So as I look at it, the next 10 years, it is about 2% today. Not very big, but twice what it was in 1999, early 2000. And I think earnings should grow at about 6%, because that is perhaps what the nominal growth rate of our economy is. And earnings forecasting for a decade is really very easy and obvious, like everything else I do. And then as corporate earnings grow at the rate of our economy. And uh, you know, they vary the charts of a remarkably stable number of corporate earnings. You know, sometimes they average 6% GDP, uh, annual GDP, uh, and uh, sometimes they're as low as, as uh, 4%, sometimes as high as 8% or even a little higher. Uh, but they stay in that narrow channel consistently. In other words, there's no, there's no slope on corporate earnings share or GDP. It's share GDP on growth. And uh, so we can expect that in the future. If we're lucky enough, we'll get 6% corporate earnings growth, maybe 5 and it'll grow soon and normal is right. Um, as a phrase that's kind of widespread and acceptance and adoption, many it's wrong, but it's a good way of looking at things. And that that would be high. Let's assume it for a minute. So if we get 6% earnings growth and 2%, dividend yield has 8% fundamental investment return. And I think the PE ratio, which nobody really knows what it is today, uh, because there's so many different ways of looking at your earnings for the problem. Uh, but I think maybe the PE will reduce that by 1%. Turning it into about 7%. Uh, total yield on the six plus two minus one to seven. And the inflation thing is, is, uh, is, is working on seven. It's that top line is eight gross and, and seven net, and you take out that one, which is easy to follow. Let's assume we have future inflation of around 2%, probably going to be low. Let's assume we have fund expenses of 2.5%. Those are the source of equity returns over on the left. Here we have use of equity returns. And the average investor who isn't conscious of expenses, to say nothing of taxes, which I ignore here, uh, is going to have a 2.5% real return in the decade. So you better get expenses out of the equation, more so now than ever. Um, bond yields, the bond market is that, and we know that bond yields have a high correlation, 91%. Uh, today's bond yields have a high correlation. People forget these things, they're so obvious. But 
that today's bond yield is a 91% variety for the return of bonds in the next decade. 91%. And so we can look at corporate bonds uh, as yielding around 5%. That's probably a little high. A high rate for us in the next decade. Um, Treasuries 3.8 for the long term. Intermediate term 2.4. And the intermediate term tip 125. And we really want to see a lower return with the five year tip, which I think today is at zero. Uh, not a very generous return, one might say. So when uh, we look at the source of use, I'm repeating that right here, the barrel of the bond market. And the bond market gives three and a half percent, which is about what that package of bonds will do. Um, you know, you can be a little bit longer and a little bit more, but that's really what there is there. And, uh, Take out one percent for expenses, uh, turn order costs probably, and that leaves a half percent for the bond yields. So if people are bent, if people today is even more time than ever before to be conscious of costs, those are huge pumps taken out of the return. So uh, the it's a very uh, very difficult time, and there is no way, no place in mind that I've never seen it more. Some of it's the returns on bonds are so terrible. In fact, that was like about three and a half equity for the uh, premium, the three and a half compared to seven. But still, uh, think about stocks at seven percent. You all know that you make hundred percent of your money over that day, and at three and a half percent, you make about fifty percent of your money over that day. So stocks, assuming we don't have some kind of disaster, which is a big assumption to me. Um, are much more attractive. The chances of bonds are not more stocks in this decade. Small. They exist, of course. So, just finally, um, oh, I should say this. You might want to ask me about this thing. Um, Vanguard is a funny movie. Have you seen this uh, Vanguard's economic capital market outlook? Well, they published this for institutional We didn't get on the website. Uh, and it's much more optimistic about equity returns. Um, but uh, than I am. And uh, well, I'm going to have to just a second. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You want to ask this afternoon. In terms of the bond market, they're looking at 3.5% and to 4% is the most probable. I think that's okay. Um, in terms of equities, Huge risks in our economy. Huge risks in our financial markets. Building, uh, 
bonds are a parole a parole under the that we can pay the uh, I think one of the things I would leave you with is be cautious. Uh, be cautious knowing that I'm not always right. And I may be wrong. Uh, I happen to be remaining about 80% bonds in my own portfolio. I haven't changed it. I haven't changed the allocation in uh, 15, 16 years. Uh, but uh, we've changed for me.
stocks or bonds, whatever it is, eight percent stocks, five percent on bonds, whatever the number is. We have that to build up year after year. There's nothing like that in months ago. Rank speculation. And so, of course, is gold. And uh, gold is now an area, and I almost have to buy gold, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, it just seems to be going up and up and up, and it gets that kind of momentum. And there's going to be a sucker that buys that last, what do you call, ounce of gold or something. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't think that's, you know, if you want to play a little bit, what, 2% or 5% even of your asset, it's a game, and who am I to say it won't work? I don't know. And, and, uh, and then hedge funds, well, some of them will work, some of them won't work. Uh, you know, usually their returns are badly eroded by costs, and I wouldn't add if they didn't have to get a hedge fund. And it worries me when I see the main parts of the full analysis of hedge fund things that they believe that are uh, asset management funds. Whatever it is, what's that market neutral fund? Where are the hedge funds coming up? Oh, and into the, it's a little surprising, into those funds with, with uh, three, four, and five percent? No. Managed payouts are three, five, and seven. And I don't believe in funds that put percentages in their name, to be very clear on that. I think it's inherently misleading. And seven uh, percent is an uncertain payout, which you want to use that way of capital, I believe. And uh, you know, Putnam has, has I contend with three, five, and seven. And one, three, five, seven, and nine. So the with a uh, some funds. Um, uh, they have two percent expense ratio. One, three, five, seven, and nine becomes three, five, seven, nine, eleven. Right? It's the math, stupid. <laughs> Again. And uh, they're all zero this year. Uh, or more down here. So there don't seem to be any easy ways of doing this, so I kind of stick down the middle be very early. I'm also worried, I don't want to get into this too much, but I'm a little worried about not just the financial system, which I'm very worried about, but uh, you know, the risks that, that lie out there uh, that are we haven't really thought much about them. Uh, you know, black swans and they play closely, and you know, the global world we live in is a very different world. The U.S. financial system is a mess. Uh, our pension fund system is technically bankrupt for the one state or local corporation. Corporations are using an 8% return pension funds are state and local are too. And uh, I don't see where you're going to get 8% in that market value vision. Stocks and bonds, you only maybe five, and for those kind of firms, if you have a point of cost, that's four, they still have to go. Uh, and, uh, Wall Street values, such as they may be, <laughs> are in tatters, a national disgrace, and yet the compensation goes on and on and on. It's really quite sickening. And leads to another thing I worry about, and I think our, you could easily argue that America's lost her ability to cover herself. You know, the political situation is in shambles. Uh, you can see these tags are so sickening. I can't watch it all. I will be the happiest guy in the world on election night. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the heads are just a disgrace, and it comes from both sides, too. Uh, but uh, it, it, we've lost something. We've lost something in our values. And, stuff. and uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to do my best to bring it back to the financial system. So some of you have already said some nice things about my book. Enough. Uh, I find a lot of resonance when I speak. Resonance when I speak about values. Uh, and I think a lot of people, young people and old alike, we're really looking for something better, something higher, something nobler. I really mean that. And uh, in these remaining days, I'm going to do whatever number they may be. Uh, I'm going to do my best um, to see if I can make a tiny difference in this uh, vast world in which we live to kind of get us back to uh, a, a more nobler vision of society. Uh, the financial system works for all of you, and not for Wall Street, yeah. all of you and your fellow investors. And uh, I'm going to just work and work on it and see if I can prove 